a National Geographic survey, 77% of all Americans believe there are signs that aliens have visited Earth. But despite this consensus, our governments have yet to acknowledge what many believe to be the truth behind extraterrestrials. Is disclosure just around the corner, as some believe, or has the UFO phenomenon always been a fabrication of the human mind? The evidence has been mounting that our governments indeed know more than they are telling. In recent years, a growing number of credible scientists and investigative researchers have been lobbying for the truth to be told. One of these advocates is Stanton Friedman, a top nuclear physicist who has worked for GM, GE, Westinghouse, Aerojet General Nucleonics and McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. Friedman has published more than 90 UFO papers and has appeared in countless documentaries and hundreds of radio and TV programs, including Larry King. And what it really would take would be a Woodward and Bernstein who blew the lid off the political Watergate to blow the lid off the cosmic Watergate. The data's there. Quote General Bolander, show the NSA and CIA documents. You can't deny their reality. Jim Mars is the author of Alien Agenda, the top-selling non-fiction UFO book in the world. Mars began teaching a course on UFOs at the University of Texas at Arlington in 2000 and has since appeared on ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, C-SPAN, as well as the Discovery, Learning and History channels. Today all you have to do is Google UFOs on, uh, and look at the images and you can't take a picture of an hallucination or, or a psychosis. So they're real. So the question now is, what is the alien agenda? Stephen Bassett has been fiercely advocating the end of the 68-year government-imposed truth embargo regarding the ET presence. An executive of Paradigm Research Group, Bassett is the executive producer of the X Conference, the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure, and the Congressional Hearing Initiative. Uh, we, we're facing the potential for a massive renaissance in science, in political reform, and none of that can happen because the governments of the world will not yet even acknowledge the existence of the ETs. Kathleen Marden is known around the world for her work as an alien abduction ET contact researcher, author and lecturer. She is recognized as the world's leading expert on the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case and is the recipient of MUFON's 2012 Ufologist of the Year Award. My research and the evidence and the scientific evaluation of that evidence has convinced me that this case is real and that it was being covered up by the government and by a small group of debunkers who wanted to make Betty and Barney look like kooks. Ron James is a prolific filmmaker and writer. He is author of the book Messiah Awakenings and has won many awards, including the EBE Award for ET-related films four times. There are a lot of races throughout the universe and that there's very, very many of them that are so far advanced beyond us that we probably can't even comprehend their technology or what they're capable of. And how we play into that, we don't know. Patty Greer is one of the most devoted crop circle filmmaker researchers today having produced six documentary films that have received prestigious awards. Greer's data brings metaphysics, ET technologies and science together to offer a clear understanding of this astounding phenomenon. This is the most important story never told, how real this is on the planet, and the fact that all these people being well paid are being paid to not tell the truth, that's old paradigm. And all the money now is behind making sure that this information doesn't get out. I'm not expecting there will be full disclosure. There are plenty of reasons for the government not to disclose what they have learned. Because if they've learned any technological stuff, why should the U.S. put it on the table if the Russians and Chinese don't put on the table what they have learned? If you're waiting on a government official to hold a big press conference and say, okay, okay, here's the truth about UFOs, uh, you're going to be waiting a long time, okay? Because any government official that would admit to that is then admitting that they've lied to us <coughs> for 70 or 80 years. We need to, to, to tell the world's people the truth. 
That's disclosure. Now, once that's happened, I anticipate uh, a year or two of intense engagement of the issue by everyone. And after about a year or two, I think the planet will be collectively ready, not, not for disclosure, but rather for open contact. I have a feeling open contact will follow. We this year, we Earthlings, will spend a trillion dollars on things military. A trillion dollars. Well, thousands of children die every single day of preventable disease or starvation. Uh, nationalism is the only game in town. There's just too much to lose, too much uh, uh, water under the bridge. I'm very involved in the disclosure process politically, and I do believe that it serves a very, very important purpose. And that purpose is to keep the pressure on. If you're doing this work with clarity, you're going to bring a lot of truth to the public. The races of greys, and this is what I specialize in, are telling individuals that there is not going to be disclosure by them immediately. In fact, I think we're in undergoing a uh, conditioning process right now through movies and TV and news accounts and sightings and abductions and crop circles, you name it. It's all around us and more and more people are beginning to understand that this is a serious issue. There is a program in the works so that we will be able to communicate with them and they'll be able to communicate with us. I believe that there's kind of a plan to this, that it's uh, been done before, and they have, they have been helping to drive the process, that they want self-disclosure, open contact is to follow. Uh, what I believe is happening right now is that this political pressure is combining with all of the other different pressures coming from different places and the media to create an atmosphere where the knowledge is readily being distributed. There would be a big discombobulation for the world it's possible they may lose their patience. If we drag this out long enough, they may be forced to do a force majeure disclosure event. There's a big difference between the world governments announcing to their citizens the presence of extraterrestrials and providing information, and extraterrestrials forcing their reality on the world's people uh, outside of government involvement. I know of no government on this planet that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet instead of that individual government. So I'm not expecting full disclosure. I don't want to see it. I want the government to say, yes, we're being visited. We're holding these international conferences to deal with the psychological, religious, uh, technological, et cetera, aspects of that. Full disclosure is only going to come from them, OK? And think about it. All they got to do is hover over a city long enough for the news crews to get out and take footage and then the game's up. Over time, they think that we will evolve to the point where we can establish communication, but it is at some point in the future, it is not going to happen immediately according to the reports that I've received. Telling the truth in times of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. Uh, look. The, the, the situation as we know it is this. There's an extraterrestrial presence. It's probably been engaging us for a very long time. Well, I think, yeah, when you consider the universe is, is billions of years old, and I think even the Earth is somewhere like four billion years old, it's pretty hard to believe that us who have uh, recorded history of like 4,000 years are the beginning of intelligent life on the planet. There's a lot of evidence on the planet that indicates that very advanced civilizations have come and gone because you can look at these places and see that it was too perfect for us to do with the tools and the technology that we had at the time. Therefore, what was the other element that gave us the ability to create these wonderful things if it wasn't some sort of intervention? UFOs are real, not something fictional or imaginary, and I think that's beyond dispute today. Um, when I was a kid, they, they said, well, they're just hallucinations or or some kind of mass psychosis. And of course, today, all you have to do is Google UFOs on, on, and look at the images, and you can't take a picture of an hallucination. There is an extraterrestrial presence. That's an absolute fact. It's not a theory. It's not a speculation. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute fact. Just because the government says, no, it's not, well, that doesn't change that. And besides, anybody that believes the government these days is foolish. And uh, the, the government has known about this ET presence. That's an absolute fact. The concern about the malevolence of certain human groups, and they are attempting to interfere or intervene in our evolution at this point in order to 
bring us to a point where we won't destroy ourselves because they're afraid that we might do that. I think they're here for their purposes. One of them was probably to quarantine us. Who, if you were an alien, would you want us out there? Military budget a trillion this year? In World War II, we killed 50 million people? We destroyed 1,700 cities? And I think the alien agenda is to observe and try to help kick the human evolution up the evolutionary ladder uh, in a covert manner so that we will hurry up and become part of the intergalactic community uh, instead of wiping ourselves out with thermonuclear weapons. Andromedans are one of 139 planetary systems that comprise the Interstellar Alliance. We are and have always been the watchdogs of the universe for nearly two million years. On the other hand, let's not act as if we're their equals. I don't talk to the squirrels in my backyard. I might say uh, scat once in a while, you know. So we're not equals. People say, why don't they land on a White House lawn? The President of the United States does not speak for seven billion Earthlings. That's pretty darn clear. The, the universe is at least 13 to 14 billion years old. We have a young star. There were stars like ours and planets like ours billions of years before our star existed. So if life can develop on uh, Goldilocks planets, which it does, there has been life in this universe going back billions of years before we existed. And so the idea that extraterrestrial civilizations have been engaging other planets and, 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 and exploring the, the galaxy makes total sense. And so uh, uh, we very well have had extraterrestrial uh, engagement going back as far as you want to go, even before this planet had, had a biosphere, maybe. I think that they don't want us to kill ourselves because if we do, we're going to destroy this beautiful planet as well. They use this planet too. We have exploded 2,000 nuclear warheads on this planet, only two on people, thank goodness. We're not nice guys. There seems to be a lot of circumstantial evidence that they have been here for thousands of years, but they seem to have stepped up their program. I don't know if they've done this in our past history, but they seem to have stepped up their program after we exploded atomic, atomic bombs. And, I, and they do say that they are very, very concerned about our behavior. We have joined the community of planets that have learned that the major source of energy in the universe is nuclear fusion. All the stars produce their energy that way. That's new information. We didn't know that 100 years ago. Uh, that means also that you could use fusion to go out there. So I think aliens have every reason to be concerned about the idiots on this planet taking their brand of friendship out there. That's hostility by everybody else's definition. So I don't expect them to treat us like, we're, we're good guys, guys, can we sit down and talk? I don't think so. There's no question that the truth about flying saucers has been covered up. If you look at 156 NSA Umbra UFO documents, you can read one sentence per page. That's a cover-up. I've got a bunch of uh, CIA top-secret Umbra UFO documents. They're all blacked out except for a couple words per page. That's a cover-up. It's no longer about UFOs and hasn't been for a long time. It's an acronym. It's an it's a anachronistic uh, uh, non sequitur. It's a government-sponsored uh, propaganda acronym, and it doesn't apply at all. It's about extraterrestrials, extraterrestrial craft, and extraterrestrial engagement. I'm not sure our government is in a position to negotiate policy with any of these species. I'm pretty sure that if there's been some sort of interaction, it hasn't been a negotiation. It's been a more like, this is how it is, and you're just going to have to deal with it. We have the facts that were enunciated by Air Force General uh, Carol Bolander who was asked what should we do about Project Blue Book after the University of Colorado recommended it be closed, ostensibly the only UFO group that the government was mixed up with. And in a memo he wrote, which resulted in the closure of Project Blue Book, he said reports of UFOs which could affect national security are not part of the Blue Book system, which is an incredible statement. Two paragraphs later he said if we close Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report UFO sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated 
using the procedures designed for that purpose. I located General Bowler, this is 10 years after he wrote the memo, that's when I first found out about it. Talked to him and suggested, it sounds like you're talking about two separate communication channels. Uh, the important ones, the government related ones, and I just had a case, I said, like a saucer going down the runway at a SAC base where nuclear weapons are stored. By definition, that's a national security problem. Or routine, if my wife and I go out at the end of the driveway and see a saucer fly over, no big deal. And he agreed with me, two separate systems. And I'm interested primarily in the ones that could affect national security. Collectively, in the, in the, they, there is a 50% plus consensus, it's time to reveal this. But the military industrial complex is not a democracy. It is not a vote. Uh, it is a, a much more complex decision. Because we need to understand that the only people with all the fancy equipment, I mean, I don't have my own radar system, for goodness sakes, the government does. Radar systems, gun cameras, uh, other instrumentation on board aircraft, spy satellites, all this kind of stuff. And that stuff's all born classified. So it's not a conspiracy notion, it's the reality. After that is a vast array of assertions, speculations, and theories that have varying degrees of probability attached. But we cannot assess that, or parse that, organize that, study that, because the government say there is nothing to study. Look, uh, there was a big explanation for Roswell, crash test dummies, stories about bodies. Ah, we were dropping crash test dummies all over the place. There are two major problems with that. None of them were dropped until six years after Roswell, and they were the same size and weight as pilots. By definition, they were tra checking on ejection seats. They're six feet tall, 175 pounds, made out of wood, and in Air Force gear clothing, because that affected the drag and heating as you dropped them out of an airplane at a high speed, at a high altitude. So they got away with it. It was good enough in the New York Times, they bought it. The real problem is the failure of the press to do its job. It's a cosmic Watergate, and they're acting like it's Alice's Tea Party. And any interstellar race could destroy this planet without really a lot of effort. We are like kindergarten children to them in terms of our ability to, quote, fight. What if there's way more to the picture? What if there is a series of different alien races that all have a different agenda? And what if we really have no control over what our outcome's going to be? We know that there could be hostile entities out there who have malevolent intentions toward us and toward our, not, maybe not toward our planet, but they may want our planet for their own needs. Hollywood blockbusters, as well as independent films, have long capitalized on the public's interest in the UFO phenomenon. Richard Lowry's film utilizes actual case studies and depicts a looming alien invasion. His earlier film, Destination Mars, is a parody of the 1950s flying saucer movies, but subversively conveys the message that mankind's quest for destructive weaponry could result in our own annihilation by an alien race. The final speech from the alien leader proclaims this very clear warning. I have studied the Earthlings for many eons, from their pre-evolutionary stages to this, their final hour. And it is this gain in knowledge which has enabled all other planetary civilizations the proper tools for adopting indomitable minds, minds forged of thought and reason, rather than British impulse. It was only a matter of time until they stumbled upon an atmospheric vaporizer. But what the foolish Earthlings did not surmise is our power in controlling their world. From their floods, to their fires, to their earthquakes, and even to their solar eclipses. The elderly subject of Lowry's documentary, The Wicksboro Incident, also sends the warning that aliens have been coexisting with us for decades, and the small town in Texas where he and his comrades constructed a device that could detect who was human and who wasn't, was erased from existence. Well, I think that the government had to, uh, had to cover up the existence of the town, had to cover up all of those deaths, so therefore, they came in and they bulldozed over. They just flattened that sucker right out. When the documentarians travel to Texas and locate the man's secret underground workstation, they are suddenly pursued by men in black, leading to the subject's on-screen assassination by a sniper. Oh, shit! 
the number one thing that would protect us from, I would you say, the outlier, the rogue uh, uh, threat, would be an alliance with those entities and civilizations which have no intentions of allowing that to happen, which may very well be a reason why this process is underway right now. What, what protects a smaller country in this world right now from being invaded by a larger country? Alliances between that smaller country and more powerful countries that don't want to see that kind of behavior. I believe they're here. I think they're among us somewhere, and I think they're scouts. See, I don't think they're here to invade America or invade the world yet. They're scouting us right now. And someday, when they finally do it, they're coming here in droves. I mean, millions are gonna come here and they're taking over. Whatever your reason is for coming here, understand we have no intention nor interest in keeping you alive. So I'm dead either way, right? Correct. No one will be spared. Why? The Earth's position in this solar system provides us with a strategic and tactical advantage. Robert, the human role in the universe is inconsequential. That may be so, but we have a right to exist. Only if we allow it. And we don't. But there is a mythos that says that there's like a reptilian species that's out there that has been instrumental in our genetic engineering and that their end is not really something that's going to be copacetic with what we'd like to see happen. If a major threat from another star system were to occur and we did not have protection from other star systems, we would be uh, screwed. Uh, they, they, the government put that kind of stuff out early days in, in order to persuade people to just avoid the issue. Meaning, you know, maybe it's true, but you know, it'll, everybody will go insane, so don't bother. It's all bullshit. It's all, all propaganda. Uh, uh, we could have handled the ET announcement in 1947. We just, we just went through a world war with 40 million people killed. We had millions of men overseas. Oh, we, we did unbelievable sacrifice. Uh, and so we're going to fall apart because we learned there's extraterrestrials in the world in 1947. I don't think so. You know, there's a lot of people with different opinions as to why the government will not disclose. But there's several that's, that resonate with me. And again, it's just my opinion. And I think that the first one is, is that even though we say that we're ready as a society, I really don't think we are. See, the truth is not what creates panics. It's lies and falsity that creates panics. And so that is another red herring that was used to justify the minds of people staying out of this issue. When Orson Welles aired his War of the Worlds radio show, it sparked such chaos and fear in the public. It's been theorized that that's one reason why the government said we better not reveal this information because it could cause a widespread panic and it could cause an entire meltdown. We could hold a, uh, a radio show that was a scripted show and put out a, uh, uh, a statement that, no, no, this is just a, uh, a script, right? But unfortunately, we didn't do it enough and not a lot of people heard it. And it was about a major virus outbreak in California and hundreds of thousands of people were coming down sick and we generate a mass panic. Does that mean that the American people can't deal with the concept of a endemic or pandemic flu? No. That was a radio show that ended up being a, a uh, people thought was true when it wasn't. In other words, it wasn't the truth, it was false. I don't think anybody would panic, believe it or not. I think they panicked back in the day, but we're sort of gotten used to the UFO syndrome, if you will. And if they landed on this planet today, we might try to be friends with them. You know what I mean? And I think that's probably what would happen. I don't think anybody would panic. The Phoenix Lights, the Stephenville flyover, all of this is, is uh, conditioning. It's the same thing we did with a, a Stone Age tribe that we found down in the Amazon Basin. Instead of rushing in with clothes and Bibles and, you know, hey, vote for me, uh, they had they cordoned off the area and kind of uh, quarantined it, not to keep them in, but to keep others out. And then a team of anthropologists slowly allowed themselves to be seen. They were seen on the hillside and then they were seen across the clearing and they slowly acclimated these people to the idea that they were there and they weren't and didn't mean any harm and then eventually they made contact with them. And this is the same type of conditioning process we're undergoing right now. 
Well, it wasn't completely ignored. It was in the newspaper several months after it happened. Well, what they did was lie. They switched, bait and switch. They changed the time, and they're talking about uh, airplanes, military planes dropping flares. It was in the wrong part of the sky. There were, as you say, a lot of witnesses. And it was at the wrong time. But they got away with it because the press isn't doing its job. And you know something? Religion's been around for thousands and thousands of years. It's very resilient, and I doubt there's anything the extraterrestrials would show us that would significantly reduce the religious uh, observance of this planet. It's time for us to expand our thinking, expand our understanding. There's, uh, there's patents for uh, tunnel digging equipment that were put together years and years and years ago for giant tunnel boring machines capable of you know, just drilling through anything for huge uh, amounts of miles in very short periods of time. And those patents were formed and then these machines supposedly never made it into production, but we know that they possibly exist. Underground secret bases, otherwise known as dumb, deep underground military bases, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're there, and uh, I've seen the specs and the pictures of the giant boring machines that they have that can just cut right through heavy rock and produce it within minutes a tunnel that's big enough to drive an 18-wheeler through. And so, yeah, these bases exist. Now, what exactly they'll be used for, if they'll ever be used, that's another question. Corso is speaking about one, only one aspect. Uh, the fact is it, though, that the number of craft have been in the hands of the U.S. government for decades, being extensively studied with billions of dollars, uh, primarily in underground facilities, uh, where they are trying to re-engineer and, and uh, achieve, um, uh, well, weapons and what have you. And I went to uh, this place called Nordhausen, which was a vast underground base where they, they still had some of the U-2 engines, and the Russians had just put some rocks in there and, and left it where you could see the, the technology from Patamunda and the V2, the V3, the V4. And I believe that technology moved so fast, I almost believe there might have been some help from some other people not of our world. There's been a lot of talk about uh, maybe uh, mixed human alien partnerships working in some of these underground bases such as the one that is reportedly at Dulce, New Mexico. Uh, that is in my huh file. <laughs> I go, huh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I've heard enough to suggest that there may be something to all that and yet I've not seen hard enough evidence to just say conclusively, yes, that exists and that's happening. That's one of those areas where we do not have 100% certainty. We have a lot of evidence and a lot of some first-hand and second-hand testimony that implies underground facilities. But, but we know that they have that. They built underground facilities as part of the Cold War. We actually drove up to the Dulce base to get some establishing shots up there. So we started driving up toward the uh, Archuleta Mesa, which is where the, uh, the base is. We were being followed. and. Uh, and, and we all became a little bit unsettled and a little concerned that uh, we were getting ourselves into something that, that could get us into trouble. So we actually we got out of there. The question is, do we have underground facilities devoted to the extraterrestrial question? And there is evidence for that. The issue of the relationship between extraterrestrials and technology, uh, terrestrial technology, is a very interesting, complex issue. It, it became a significant uh, matter uh, when uh, Philip Corso, Colonel Philip Corso, wrote his book, The Day After Roswell, where he stated matter-of-factly that he was in charge under General Trudeau at the uh, Foreign Technology Desk in trying to sprinkle some of the ideas obtained from examining the Roswell craft. If we've recovered alien craft and we've back-engineered technology, then we really don't want to put it out that we have this and that we know about it. And sadly, that's a, uh, that's a detriment to the advancement of collective human civilization. Which is to say that if, in fact, the United States government has mastered the ability to tap into ground state fields and is sequestering that technology, it is criminal because the availability of that technology would transform this planet, save hundreds of millions of lives, and solve a great deal of our most difficult problems. And so every day that the truth embargo continues and that technology is sequestered, people are dying because of it.
So in their attitude is, well, yeah, now some people are going to die, but you know, we still want another 20 years of secrecy. Well, tell that to the people that are suffering. Uh, and we know too much now. It's too much out in the open. So now the blood is on their hands. We are paying a fortune for energy. People are dying because they can't afford water, food. Uh, we're polluting the environment, killing people with cancer. And they are sitting on transformative energy that might be one cent on the dollar. Plus, we have evidence that we have, we have in fact, reverse engineered an anachronistic propulsion, and we have our own saucers. As we get a better understanding of the nature of reality, I believe that what today has no scientific explanation at all is going to be accepted as a scientific norm in the future. And when that happens, it's going to change the face of civilization on every level. So for decades, we have had anti-gravitic propulsion, but it is not known or available to the public because to do so would result in ending the truth embargo, and therefore it must remain sequestered. The most important question of all regarding the ET technology is have we mastered and even reverse engineered the energy system that drives those craft? We're pretty sure it's not oil, gas, or coal. In fact, our own physics points to the likelihood that they have finally figured out how to tap into the ground state fields. If they have done that, it is a paradigm shift of such magnitude, it's almost impossible to describe. What if they cure cancer? What if they help us clean away pollution and help these children with respiratory problems and water problems and, and help us make this the paradise that we had when we got this planet. We've been using that wreckage to reverse engineer this technology. I, I believe we have a technology right now that's far beyond what the public even knows about. Now it's an interesting point. Given that we have the ability in a device smaller than a laptop to store the entire Library of Congress, every book in it, and more, the idea that extraterrestrials may have storage ability to have enormous archives regarding this planet, in which case we might have the opportunity at some future time to directly uh, research our ancient history with visual records. Look at all the historical events that we don't have eyewitness testimony from, whether it's Moses you know, in the Red Sea or whatever. So there are all kinds of possibilities. I'm Kathleen Martin. Betty and Barney Hill were my aunt and uncle. They are the first Americans whose story went to the public about a UFO abduction that occurred in 1961. Betty and Barney stated that they felt that the ETs wanted to know the difference between their bodies and human bodies. They were very interested in Betty's and Barney's skeletal structure, in their nervous systems, they took skin samples, they examined their hands, their feet, their eyes, their ears, their mouths. We we're very different than the, this particular race of greys who took Betty and Barney. They also, I am convinced, had an agenda, and that was the hybrid agenda. They took ova from my Aunt Betty when they inserted a needle into her navel and told her it was a type of pregnancy test and they took sperm from my Uncle Barney. This experience is not only hearsay. I'm a researcher, and I investigated that case over a 14-year period. I wrote the book Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Stan Friedman joined me by writing two chapters. Under hypnosis, they remembered the landed craft on the ground and being taken up a ramp onto that craft against their will. They recalled the interior of the craft. They described it in great detail. There were pie-shaped rooms. There were wedge-shaped rooms. Uh, they were taken to separate examining rooms. There was almost like a sort of dentist chair uh, in the room that Betty was taken into. She was placed in that chair initially. Then she was taken and placed on a table. Barney did not sit on that chair. He was placed on a table. They described the interior. They described the sort of stark interior of that room. They described uh, the, the lighting in this room, this bluish white lighting. And they frightened Betty and Barney terribly. 
Betty and Bonnie didn't know if they were going to be carried away, if they were going to be made specimens, if they were even going to survive this. But the ETs telepathically apologized to them for frightening them. They reassured them that they were not going to be harmed, that they would be returned to their natural environment after they did a few tests. I was 13 years old at the time that this occurred. My mother was Betty's younger sister. Betty called my mother first when they arrived home on the morning of September 20th, 1961. I was in the room with my mother. One of Betty's reasons for calling my mother was because we had a neighbor who was a physicist and Betty was concerned about radiation and she wanted to know what to do. This physicist, for some unknown reason, uh, told Betty that if she had a compass, she should take it out to the car to see how the needle reacted. Well, the funny thing is, that doesn't measure radiation, it measures a magnetic field. When she went to the car, she noticed for the first time that there were shiny spots. There were concentric circles, they were all the same size. And she held the needle over those spots and it caused the compass needle to spin and spin. And the dress that Betty was wearing on the day of September 19th uh, had been in perfectly fine shape when she put it on that morning. When she returned home the next morning, the, there was a tear in the thick zipper fabric. The stitching was torn at, by the zipper as well. Betty Hill's drawing of the infamous star map drew critical response from astronomers and researchers, including Carl Sagan. However, years later, the drawing was proven to be an accurate representation of the Zeta Reticulum system. This alone eliminated the chance of a hoax. They were credible individuals. Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. Barney worked for the post office, but he was also, in 1965, given a position on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission in the New Hampshire State Advisory Committee. They were credible people. They were social rights, civil rights activists. They absolutely had nothing to gain. They had everything to lose when this story went public as the result of a violation of confidentiality in 1965. I'm Patty Greer. I'm a crop circle researcher and filmmaker, and I have been in more than 100 crop circles in the last 10 years. I have a communication with the circle makers that happens usually at 3 in the morning. When you walk into a crop circle, you're going in a tram line, which is the tractor tire lines where it's already laid down. So you don't want to ever disturb the field of the farmers. As long as you stay in the tram lines, it's considered etiquette. And what I feel in the crop circles is a very strong, enhanced electromagnetic field. And almost everybody can feel it unless you're completely insensitive or not willing. The interesting thing is that as you're walking in the tram line, about 10 feet, 20 feet before you get there, the hair stands up on your arm, so you know you're close. Once you go in a crop circle and you, the whole body lights up head to toe, there's no doubt. It's like when somebody has a sighting of a spaceship, you can't tell them they didn't. So when people say to me, all crop circles are fake, I say to them, well, there you go. That's really it. There was one scientist in the world that I know of that went public. His name is William Levengood. He's very, very famous. And he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for writing more scientific papers that made it into science journals than anyone else on the planet. And he's the man that proved that not only are crop circles real, but they're coming out of the earth. And what Levengood discovered is that it is plasma balls of light that are laying the crop circles down in seconds but the way the plasma gets energized enough is through these spinning, counter-rotating vortices. So it's a really clear science that makes sense. And when we realize that they're actually initially coming out of the ground, it really makes sense. Why would the mother be complaining? Well, gosh, we're fracking her, we're draining her blood, and then we're fracking her some more, and we're dumping stuff, and we're poisoning everything. And so she's been shooting up these messages for 200 years that we know of, and humanity's just gotten worse and worse. 
and a lot of the most important messages are put in binary code. They'll put it in a code that they know can be deciphered by a mathematician uh, or a computer. And some of the most important binary codes have really referred to times in history, such as the alien face and the disk. I'll just point out that this was the year after 9-11 happened. And the message was, beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe, there is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing. Crop circles are messages that are being written to us from inner earth, from our ET brothers and sisters. Crop circles are not only real, but the seeds inside the crop circles can produce up to 400% more food, with up to 75% more nutritional value per seed. Well, of course they're gonna suppress it. When Monsatan, Monsanto owns the government, um, they don't want healthy food to be multiplied by 400%. In the last year or two, the military has really um, nailed the farmers and asked them not only to not let people in, but to mow out the crop circle on the first or second day that it arrives. We always fly over it and we always get photos, but then the next day it's like a blown field. So when we see um, these farmers destroying the field, it's very interesting that a lot of times the circle makers will just come back and hit them with a new pattern in the same field the very next day. I have been wonderfully hacked for four years. My phone, my computer, Everything I do has been unbelievably difficult. And you know, my answer is, I'm sorry for those that are doing it because I'm not stopping. So they're actually initially coming out of the earth in pairs. They're coming out in these spinning vortices. One's going clockwise, the other's going counterclockwise. So William Levengood proved that they were coming out of the ground and as they come up spinning, and they've already predetermined what they need from humanity, from their ET friends, they're already with their plasma energy, their frequencies that need to be added to what she sent up. And when the three frequencies meet, there are some that are not ET at all, they're just Earth and us. Some of them are humans meditating and then the circle happens the next day. I have three of those in my movies. They blow into these beautiful balls of light, radiant orange balls of light, which all of us have seen that do night watch and they communicate, two plasmas communicate, and bang, that field goes down in seconds. The problem in the field now is that the famous crop circle researchers still today are not coming up with the new information. They're kind of stuck in the 1980s and 90s data, and the fact that they're not really talking about the great work of William Lovengood when they actually know the great work, but rather dissing him, it's a sad time in our history where the money is going behind misinformation rather than information. I am committed to make a difference here, and it's not me, anybody special, but the fact that I work with the circle makers and I find these are so incredibly real and beautiful, it just keeps me excited. And things keep happening to me where I'm in communication. It's not like I'm even asking or looking for it, they just keep showing up. The fundamental conclusion is an extraterrestrial presence, and we absolutely must acknowledge it as soon as possible. After that, you'll be surprised how quickly things start sorting themselves out and getting resolved. So my conclusion is that I think we are an inch from disclosure. I don't think they can hold it back. I think that it's not even about getting the government to tell us the truth, it's about leaving them behind. There's a lot of evidence that advanced civilizations and possibly non-human entities have been here and occupied the planet in the past. Some of them seem to be astronauts coming here from another planet who have technology that's so highly advanced that it looks like magic to us. Well, my 1990s book, Alien Agenda, uh, started off with the premise that UFOs are real, not something fictional or imaginary, and I think that's beyond dispute today. Let's get this out in the open regardless of whatever our government thinks. Again, they've proven they're not always right, and they've proven that we need as American citizens to get this information out in the open. Disclosure could potentially happen within the next 20 years, and I'm hoping it does because it's going to change everything for the better. 
Well, my conclusion is that we're dealing with intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft visiting our planet. We're dealing with a cosmic water gate, that there are no good arguments against those two conclusions. And we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium being treated like Alice's Tea Party, instead of how important it really is. A fabrication of the human mind, or the greatest story never told? And if the truth is finally revealed, how will it affect the human condition? We may soon find out.